it's a tremendous honor to be here and to see that you're all still here too. Um, it's, um, I've been making films for about eight years. Uh, my job has been to produce, direct uh, films. And this is obviously not just a job, it's a passion and a craft that I've been doing out of belief that it can create significant change in the world. But what is the change that a film can actually create? Many people wonder about that and I have a sense that some of you might be wondering the same. And when I haven't slept for many weeks because I've been in the editing room trying to finish a film and midnight hits on the clock and it's the third time in a row, I start doubting my life choices as well. But my last documentary film, Budrus, made a lot of different ideas about impact come together and really consolidated in a fundamental way my belief in the work I do. And so I wanted to share those with you. About four years ago, a colleague I work very closely with told me about a series of events that took place in a village about two hours northwest of here called Budrus. And what happened in this village was a, were a series of nonviolent demonstrations to try to prevent the destruction of the community through the building of the Israeli wall. And they've succeeded. When I heard that story, I thought it sounded like a really potential great one for our documentary film. But I was a little bit skeptical of whether it could really have been everything that my colleague was telling me, because I had not seen any coverage of it in the mainstream media. And I know that the media coverage of this conflict is tremendously problematic, but this story seemed a little bit too extraordinary to have missed at all. But I was intrigued, so I decided to investigate. I started contacting dozens of activists from all over the world who had been to Budrus during those demonstrations. And what happened was my office started getting flooded with videotapes coming from France, from South Africa, from England, from Israel, from Palestine. And the footage that I saw showed that this was a unique series of events that deserved to be told in a story. I accidentally became the history writer of an absolutely extraordinary event that took place very close to here in this village. And I wanted to show you the trailer of um, the film that I made out of it. ان الجدار حسب ما جميع الاعلان كان يكون انه يفصل بين فلسطين واسرائيل هون في بدروس انه هي اكتشفنا انه جدار لسلب الاراضي Defense has in fact created a solution to terror اليوم انتم مدعوون لمسيره سلميه يتضامن معكم العشرات من اخواتكم الاسرائيليين We saw the men trying to push the soldiers but none of them could do that but I think the girls could do it لازم إذا بدك تنجح تقييم مخك التقليدي. لأن كنا في اتفاق كامل وكنا حابين إن هذه الجيش تتوزع على كل فلسطين. وحدة 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 وبرشوتام كل هامتسائين لخاص
הייתי בטוח שכולנו נמות. והנה, הנה האנשים מסביבי, שאפילו לא מתחפפים. A non-violent protest is not going to stop the ultimate way of defense. This is a peaceful march. There is no need to use violence. Thank you. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised when the film came out and all of the different newspapers that had never covered the story of Budrus when it happened started writing about it. We were written up about in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, their Spiegel in Germany, the London Times. We were on television all over the Western media that had ignored this movement when it happened seven years before we released our movie. And I was very surprised because it seemed like um, this is the exactly type of story that journalists might want to pick on and, and tell. It's beautiful, it's inspiring, it's people coming together to create change. Um, and I decided to ask about um, this question of the media coverage to a US journalist that I build a close relationship with last year because he saw the film and he really wanted to, to help uh, take the story into the world. And uh, he had beautiful things to say of the, about the film, but more importantly, he was surprised that he had never heard about the story of Budrus until then. Um, and so I, I asked him the question, I said, why is it that now, because of documentary film telling the story, uh, Budrus is being talked about, the movement is being talked about in, in all of these different media outlets, but it actually wasn't covered when it happened. And he thought for a moment and said confidently that Budrus wasn't part of the narrative at the time. And so it didn't get picked up for media coverage. And I thought that was a significant statement coming from someone who has been working for decades now and on the top uh, news outlets uh, in, uh, in America. Uh, so I wanted to clarify and I asked, okay, let me make sure I understood this correctly. You're saying that at the time when Budrus happened, it was 2003, 2004, that was still the height of the Second Intifada and therefore Palestinians were seen as suicide bombers. And so a story of Palestinians using civil disobedience did not fit and therefore didn't make the nightly news. And he shook his head and said yes. Um, I told this story to a friend of mine. She's a psychologist at uh, MIT. And she told me, Julia, what this journalist explained to you is something we psychologists have known and studied for a long time. We have a name for it. It's called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias uh, is a tendency we all have as human beings to select information that affirms and confirms our narratives or our biases. So we ignore things that challenge our notions that we've built over time about an issue um, and we incorporate and welcome the other ones that actually affirm those narratives. Now, um, what I am interested in as a filmmaker is how do you break through this confirmation bias? And uh, this uh, psychologist um, brought up another term for me to explain the process through which confirmation bias works, and that's cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is the uncomfortable feeling we have when a new information comes in that runs counter to a belief, a narrative that we have. And now I just want to clarify this term narrative because it can be used in several different forms. The way I'm using it here is that narrative is a collection of stories we have that together built our deep beliefs and 
attitudes towards a certain issue. And the way that cognitive dissonance operates is that it creates pain in our brain. It's actually psychologically, you know, in the research that they did, it shows that parts of our brain are generating pain. Um, and so we want to end that pain and we have two solutions. Either we ignore the new information or we open our narrative to incorporate this new information and therefore we've expanded our narrative or we've rewritten our narrative. That's what I try to do with my films. This is what I'm in the business of doing. And the reason why I chose filmmaking in order to do that is because I believe that stories, that storytelling are the best way to expand people's narratives. And that is better than facts, research, or trying to convince people rationally about something. Now, fortunately, uh, it turns out that this belief in storytelling is not just my own confirmation bias out of wanting to justify what I do for a living. Uh, it has been proven in serious laboratory uh, research. And I wanted to quote one specific researcher that's done a lot of work on this. He actually spent his life looking at the relationship between literature and the human brain. And he has said, and I'm gonna quote him, Norman Holland. He has said that we have good psychological evidence that people believe stories momentarily, even when the stories cast doubt on something they know perfectly well, it's true. And we have neurological evidence that our brains organize experience in narrative sequences. We have every reason, therefore, to believe that we respond both emotionally and intellectually more to stories than mere statements of facts. When I came across this research, I felt um, very energized because the organization that I've been working for the last seven years uh, is very much based on, on that belief. Uh, the organization is called Just Vision. We are a very diverse team of mostly young women. We are Palestinians, we are Israelis, Americans, I'm Brazilian, and we have been documenting and disseminating stories of Palestinians and Israelis who are trying to end the conflict using nonviolence. We believe that those stories are not getting appropriate media coverage and that those are the stories, among others, that can significantly help people change their narratives and understanding of what's happening here. And over the last year, I've spent touring uh, many places, I, I've had many screenings here in Palestine, screenings in Israel, screenings um, all over the world, uh, many of them in the United States. And I wanted to share one e interaction that I had with, with an audience member where I really felt a lot of those psychological terms um, came together and, and really were illustrated in a very real way. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to bring you closer to the movie with a scene that I think was key in, in how that interaction took place. The scene I'm gonna show you talk is, um, shows this a young woman, she's called uh, Iltizam, and she is the daughter of one of the leaders of the community in Budrus, who when she saw her father come home um, really disappointed one day because they, the demonstrations they were trying to organize weren't working, she went to the living room and told her dad, listen dad, you're missing 50% of the population. The women are not participating. Let me organize the women and we can do this together. And she did, and this is a scene from it. When you are face to face with a bulldozer and you are seeing it, when it's like destroying the olive trees while you were like the day before sitting under them. I really wanted to cry, but it wasn't suitable time for crying.
ما بعرف حولت فجأة لقيت حالي إنه صرت ورا الجيش وقدام الجرافة شغل تفكيري الوحيد إنه شو ممكن يعمل عندها يعني نطيت في الحفرة كنت خايفة كثير كثير The soldier could do nothing except taking the bulldozer and going away. It's good to feel even if you are small, you have nothing, but you could do all this. I'm not showing this scene to encourage Palestinian teenage girls to go jump in front of bulldozers. Uh, that, that would be very irresponsible and hypocritical because I would probably not do such a thing myself. But the beauty of our narrative wired brains is that we only need one story to significantly change our narratives about what's going on. One screening we had that was very significant for me took place in Washington, D.C. I believe um, many of you might know that one of the fastest growing grassroots movement in the United States is the Tea Party movement. That's a neoconservative group that brings together um, a, a wide variety of people from across the United States uh, one of their main sacred values is private property. It's the belief that the state should be kept away from the individual's liberty. They also have, um, many members of it have uh, been part of, of some of the growth in Islamophobic sentiment in the United States, and they tend to be uh, right wing on the conflict in the Middle East. One of the leaders of this movement came to a private screening of the film and was very moved by it. So he decided to organize another screening at the headquarters of his organization and invited all of his close friends, a community that rarely has access to this kind of story. We had a very packed uh, audience that evening and during the Q&A, a tall and imposing man got up, raised his hand and asked, but weren't the Palestinians offered compensation by the state of Israel for their olive trees? It's a very common question in the United States. And I responded the way I usually do, except with a slight change in emphasis, because I had an inkling of where that might be coming from. I said, yes, some Palestinians were offered compensation, but the vast majority of them refused to accept it, because that would be accepting and legitimizing the right of the state to impose on their private property. I watched as a big smile f filled his face. He walked towards me, he grabbed my hands, he shook it profusely, and he said, will you join me in writing an opinion piece showing how the Palestinian struggle is a libertarian one, like ours? <laughs> I haven't figured out how to respond yet. And I'm telling you this story because I think it exemplifies what a story can do in the human brain. This is just one example, and I saw many. But what happened here was that he experienced cognitive dissonance. He has been 
told time and time and again that in this conflict, Palestinians are the aggressors. In this movie, that wasn't the case. He saw as tractors were coming into this village, confiscating their land, pulling olive trees, and this village had no one to come to their help, and they decided to self-organize. So he felt pain. He had a new idea that didn't fit into his narrative. And my response helped him expand his narrative and helped him include this new fact by attaching it to a very important narrative that he has, which is about individuals' liberties and private property. The smile was the end of the pain. And this is, I think, what a lot of our work at Just Vision is. The film, in some ways, is the beginning. The conversations that happen afterwards is where this moment of actually bringing the narrative um, in, to a place that it can incorporate this new information is where the work is really done. And this is what we've been doing here in Palestine, in Israel, in the United States, across the world. And this story, I think, you know, I saw many people laughing. It doesn't go against most of the audiences here confirmation bias. But there are things that go against your confirmation bias and my confirmation bias. And I would like to encourage you, it has helped me whenever things happen, even in my personal life, not only in political issues, to actually think of these terms. When I start feeling that pain, I'm like, I'm feeling cognitive dissonance. <laughs> I'm aware of it. Um, and uh, to have an open mind, and, and, and not necessarily, I'm not saying, you know, all, the inf all the information should be incorporated, that's not the claim here, but just to be aware of it and, and try to have an open mind. I do believe that stories have the power to break through the confirmation bias and to have this cognitive dissonance be resolved in a way where more viewpoints, where more perspectives are incorporated into how we see the world. I actually think that a good story, a powerful enough story, can change the course of history. I'm not here to claim that Budrus is such a story, but I am here to say that when change comes, there will be a story. And I'll keep looking for it. Thank you.